QSO Today, episode 359, Andreas Spies, HB9BLA. This episode of QSO Today is sponsored by ICOM America, makers of the finest HF, VHF, and UHF transceivers and accessories for the radio amateur. Reminding you that ICOM now has some unique and effective communication solutions for MCOM. My thanks to ICOM America for their support of the QSO Today podcast. The QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo is coming again on August 14th and 15th. We have a lineup of over 80 amazing presentations, interesting exhibitors, and prizes. Entry to the exhibit hall is free, and a full convention pass that includes the 30-day on-demand period is only $10. We are back on the VFairs platform that we used last August, and we guarantee a smooth and flawless experience. In fact, we are offering a test run of the Expo at the end of July. Please stay tuned. Welcome to the QSO Today podcast. I'm Eric Guth for Z1UG, your host. My QSO Today is with Andreas Spies, HB9BLA, a well-known YouTube personality from Switzerland with over 330,000 subscribers, over 30 million views, focused on sensors, microcontrollers, Raspberry Pi programming, and projects that use this technology applied to amateur radio. I found Andreas on YouTube as I'm preparing my own Q0100 geosynchronous satellite Earth station to allow me to work the Kuwaiti satellite from Israel. I know that you will enjoy my QSO with Andreas, and please become a fan of his YouTube channel. HB9BLA, this is Eric for Z1UG. Are you there, Andreas? Four set one UG Hotel Bravo Nine Bravo Lima Alpha. Yes, I'm here, Eric. Andreas, thanks so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. Can we start at the beginning of your ham radio story? When and how did it start for you? When I was really young, uh, I did some ele- electric uh, electronic stuff, but very simple. And then uh, a colleague of mine uh, got a Radio Shack catalog. Uh, and uh, this was uh, was was a dream for us because uh, the Americans already had uh, 11 meters uh, rigs there, and we everything was forbidden in Switzerland. Uh, to to have a transmitter was completely not possible. I started uh, basically with a transmitter with one of my teachers when I was about 12, and uh, this was an FM radio station. And uh, he was a a teacher who knew that this was forbidden, but he helped me to to build one. So this was these were the first the first things, these first impressions I still remember. Can I ask you, Andreas, was this like a milliwatt FM radio station or was this a pirate 10 or 20 watt FM? It was one transistor, milliwatt. And uh, I had no clue uh, about antennas and all these kinds, but it worked. Uh, it was it was uh, audible uh, uh, across hundred meters or something. And then uh, I remember when I um, w- when I did a, a concert with my with my uh, with my brother, and my my parents were able to listen uh, our concert in their radio. And this was for them was very special because usually only officials were in the radio and they didn't understand exactly how it worked. But they were very proud, as if I if I uh, remember right, that uh, they heard uh, us playing. I don't know the instrument, but anyway, uh, the flute, I think it was called the flute. So uh, that, that was the first things. And then the Radio Shack stuff, uh, which uh, which uh, let us stream. And uh, then uh, in in the mid seventies, I think eleven meter was uh, was was officially allowed, also in Switzerland. And then, of course, uh, I took all my money and uh, and bought a, uh, a, 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 an eleven meter station which had five hundred milliwatts. This was the maximum power allowed there. And uh, then I started. We did. Uh, quite a lot with 11 meters. We did our field days. Uh, <laughs> we went on every hill around here because we learned that the, the distances to bridge were, of course, bigger uh, if we were on a hill. And then we learned a little bit about antennas. My first antenna was a, a television, TV, a TV antenna, because I thought an antenna is an antenna. And I tried to connect it to my 
to my rig. But uh, later we learned, of course, that uh, an 11 meter antenna has, has has to be a dipole or something like that. That were my fir- first memories. What's the hometown? It's near Basel. It, where I live now is is Lausen. I was born a little bit uh, for for an American. It's it's probably. You probably are very close to where you were born. Yeah, yeah. Many Europeans kind of stay close, whereas Americans will travel all over the country. I was away when I was young, but uh, I came back when when we got children. When did you get your first amateur radio license? Yeah, and then, of course, uh, when we were 16, we have to go to military service here. Every Everybody has, uh, every man but back then had to go to military service in Switzerland. And... Uh, I didn't want to walk and, and run and carry heavy things. Uh, so I decided to go to a Morse training because uh, when you did four years of Morse training uh, at the age of 16, then when, we, when you were 20 and had to go to military service, you had uh, a chance to get to the, to the radio operators in, in military. And then they did... They did a test uh, when we when we were when we when we arrived in the military service, and the sixteen best uh, in Morse were selected to go to a special to a special place. One of the things I think that what I've learned, you know, at least being on this side of the world, and you see it when you're trying to learn Morse code, is that, that there's a whole culture in Europe of young people that learn how to send and receive very very high speed Morris. Is that kind of related to this Swiss Morse code training? This was purely for the military. The military also organized this training because they needed, they needed skilled people because this was the Cold War, you have to remember. And our antennas in military service were, were not turnable. The enemy was in the east. <laughs> so no need to turn the antennas. <laughs> so they were fixed. And uh, we had to, to listen to the Russian uh, military services. This was our job. I mean, what, what we did, what we did uh, was uh, today is, a, is an SDR receiver doing in, in milliseconds. Sitting in a Moscow hotel connected to the LTE or something like that, right? That's nowadays. But in those days, you were actually then, the reason for your Morris Code service was to listen to the Eastern Bloc. Yep. And uh, then uh, uh, basically they were on Morse, so they need uh, the Swiss Army needed sk- skilled people, and we were trained, of course. Then during during uh, during military service, we didn't have to walk and to carry a lot, but we had to train a lot in in Morse. And uh, basically, our job was um, to to listen to 500 kilohertz up and down and up and down, and if we discovered. Uh, uh, the, the the pattern of these uh, messages, then we had to write down. We, of course, they were uh, encrypted, but we had to, just to, to look uh, for, for the header because this was not encrypted. And we had uh, stations which were able to, um, to, to find the direction. And then we saw if it was in Siberia or it was in the Czech Republic and, and so on. And these two informations, the header plus uh, where they are, or where they were, where they, the signal came from, that was basically given then to to the intelligence service where they did the pattern recognition. We were just the, the, the receivers. But, uh, it was all manual back then. So were you receiving the international Morse code, meaning were the Russians, if they sent a da-da, was it an A? Or was it something in Cyrillic? Or you just copied the characters? We don't know. I mean, the Morse code is international. What a da-da means was not interesting for us. This was for the higher level. But you would copy it down as an A? Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. So, And then they would turn it into whatever they thought it meant. And, uh, of course, uh, I was also in, in other uh, services like that in military, and I always knew that uh, I didn't want to know everything because uh, if you are valuable there, you're, you can be treated miserably. Like all military services, for example. So let me ask, you did your stint in the military, and then did your interest in electronics and radio play a part in your higher education? First, uh, you asked me about uh, my, my first license, and 
During the military service, we, we went up to, to 25, 30, 35 words per minute. So we were quite fit to, uh, for, for the amateur radio uh, training, which requested, uh, required there uh, then, uh, back then, Morse code. So just after the military service, most of us uh, went and, uh, and got, the, got the license back then. The electronic theory was part of your training, or did you learn that on your own? I, I, I learned this also in a school before, in a, organized by the hams uh, around here. The electronics was not the problem back then. It was really the Morse. Most of people, most of people had, had more problems to get the, the Morse on an on a acceptable level than uh, the electronics. I think on the American side, that was also the case, the Morse code. I remember spending hours listening to records. Yeah. The Amico Morris Code course over and over again in order to be able to pass the test. Okay, well, that's very interesting. So what was your first call sign? It is always the same. They, they didn't change it. I asked 40 years uh, after, after I gave, gave it back. I asked, do you still have it? And I got it back. I think that probably works here in Israel like that, too. Once you have it, you have it almost forever. We never changed we ne- we changed the scheme, but not not the the existing uh, the existing call signs. And did you have a first rig? Did you build a first station? I had it actually before I was licensed, <laughs> because it had also eleven meters on it. It was a summer camp FT two seventy seven, and it was very expensive back then. You say summer camp. Yeah, this was, a, they, they called it, Yesu was called Summer Camp before. This is an old, uh, the, the old brand, at least in Europe. It is a, a Yesu, FT, today you would call it Yesu, but the, the branding was Summer Camp. FT-277. What kind of antenna did your parents allow you to put on the house? I, I had an antenna mast. I do not remember I think it it was VHF back then, mostly when I started with uh, licensed my first antennas. But uh, I wanted to build a tower, but my neighbor was not uh, willing to allow it. So I I had to to skip this this project. I I already had a tower, but I didn't ask the neighbor. So uh, he intervened and then uh, it was forbidden to build this, uh, this antenna tower. But I didn't have a lot of uh, antennas because but then I went to Zurich for my studies. I did my electronic studies in, uh, in Zurich uh, at our technical university. So that would be the same as like a bachelor's of science in electronic engineering like we would have in the States? So it's a four-year program? Four-year program, yes. And then what happened after that? Did you actually go into the electronic industry? I needed to make money. No chance for to go into electronics in Switzerland. It's, uh, it's not very famous in Switzerland. I did a little bit of development work, about two years or so, because I, I thought I, I, owe, I owe it to my, my study and my hobby. But then I discovered that I didn't have a hobby anymore. And after my electronics study, I did a Master's of Business, business Administration in parallel of my working Basically, after that, I had two possibilities to stay, to stay with electronics in development or whatever, research and development, or to go towards uh, w- what I learned with the MBA, and then I decided to go into uh, marketing. And now this message from ICOM America. You may know that ICOM America has been supplying radios to North American market for almost 50 years. You may not know that ICOM makes communication solutions for aviation, land mobile, and marine as well. As hurricane season kicks off in June and wildfire season is upon the West, ICOM has advanced emergency communication systems for emergency organizations, including your ARES, that would survive the loss of commercial infrastructures that serve these areas. In addition to ICOM's line of amateur radio products, including D-Star, Digital, HF, and Analog Radios, ICOM now has their new ICSAT-100 portable push-to-talk satellite communicators and the IP501H and M LTE radios to offer very wide area communications for those state and region-wide emergencies. ICOM's ICSAT-100 is the perfect handheld satellite radio for use outside of cellular or push-to-talk network range. 
By operating on Iridium's constellation of satellites, the ICSat-100 can quickly and easily connect with other push-to-talk devices from virtually anywhere. Mobile versions are also available. The ICSat-100 includes an emergency call button, the AquaQuake feature, which is an IP67 waterproof rating, and a vibrating function that keeps water out of the speaker. It has AES 256-bit encryption and a voice recording function. The IP501H and the IP501M radios provide instant wide area coverage over LTE. By using an LTE network, you bypass the need for pre-existing push-to-talk infrastructure, allowing nationwide coverage without the added cost of building and maintaining your own repeater network. A mobile version is available. These radios include Priority Interrupt Calling, Individual, Group, Talk Group, Multiplex, Talk Group, and All Calls, Emergency Button, loan worker feature and man down functions vibration alert notifications connect to all of these devices and more even systems operating on different protocols with the VE-PG4 ROIP or radio over internet protocol gateway from land mobile and LTE radios to IP communication terminals and IP phone systems, they all work together to form one seamless and uninterrupted network, ensuring your emergency comms are received and forwarded. The VE-PG4 is your bridge connection between radio systems, an LTE transceiver gateway, an IP phone interconnect, a multi-site connection between other VE-PG4s, external equipment connection, ICOM's VEPG4 solves all of your interoperability needs. Emergency communications groups and amateurs that serve them have complex communications needs, often beyond what amateur radio alone can solve. ICOM has the solutions to bridge any disaster situation to keep emergency personnel in touch. To learn more about these essential communication products from ICOM, click on the link in this week's show notes pages. And now back to our QSO today. So your career was in marketing. Yeah, it was product management, which was, which was always at the, at, at the, between, mar- between uh, the market and, uh, and technology. I think this is what I did my whole life uh, because I had these two studies, which, were, which was very rare in the 80s. Most of people had either marketing or, or technic, uh, technological degree, but I was very... Uh, seldom or rare, and uh, and then uh, I, I I went on. Uh, we got our kids, and we 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 moved back to where I live now. Moved back from Zurich to Basel, and then uh, my headhunter said, "For your for your job profile, you have to go to sales, just as an education, because if you ha- haven't been in sales, uh, it's not a it's not good." I completely agree. From today, I learned. Uh, ver- I learned a lot in sales about people and about uh, decision making and all these kind of things. This helps everywhere. So I, I strongly suggest to young people, uh, not only to stay in in te- technology, to go also once in sales. I joined Digital Equipment Corporation back then, which was a growing company, very, ex- a very exciting company, was probably my best employer. It was an incredible time there. We grew like hell. There was no, no variable pay. We just, everybody had a fixed, a fixed salary, no variable pay, even in sales. This is completely ununderstandable these days, but this was the case. So valuable pay, to translate that to the American audience, would be commissions based on sales? No commissions. And we usually we, we had our our budget in the first half year. We made our budget, but there was no slowdown for the next half year because we just were, were excited about what we what we were able to achieve and so on. So uh, even without commissions, so it's uh, it was it was an interesting an interesting time. But uh, unfortunately, digital went uh, went down in the uh, mid mid nineties. When these, uh, we were basically serving the pharmaceutical industry, and when risk computing came, HP took over, and Sun and uh, Silicon Graphics and stuff like that. And then um, I had to to go on, 
and I discovered another interesting uh, company back in 1995. It was a very young company, German company called SAP. It was not very well known, but I saw as from my business administration point of view, I saw that they had a lot of potential. Right. So SAP for, I would imagine for the American audience, because it's very popular in Europe and here, does a huge MRP accounting systems, right? It's called ERP, Enterprise Resource Planning, because it, it covers not only manufacturing, it covers uh, finance, it covers HR, it covers sales, it covers purchasing. It's a huge end-to-end solution for large companies. At least it was back then. Then uh, if you had SAP, you didn't need uh, a lot of other stuff. Right. I see that here. SAP is very strong in Israel. It's probably the most predominant accounting ERP solution. And this is still the best because I did an evaluation just recently in in Dubai for Emirates Airline. There, There it was Oracle and SAP, which is Oracle and SAP are heads on. But for manufacturing industry, it was clear after the evaluation that SAP still is the best is the best deal for governments and stuff like that with uh, not very standardized processes. Oracle is okay, but but not for the manufacturing industry. Oracle has purchased a number of companies, so their suite could be PeopleSoft or JD Edwards, One World, or something like that. That's one of their problems because you have to to bring them together, and they are completely un. And not not compatible, and this uh, the customer expects that you make it compatible, but it's it's hard. It's millions of dollars of consulting fees. Yeah, I mean we also. I, I uh, had the chance once. Uh, the, my one of my customers paid a Concorde flight for me back then, because uh, I said I do not come to Europe unless you pay me a, a flight with a Concorde. And uh, so he said, okay, I need you, and he paid. These were the times there, and uh, it, was, uh, it was crazy times. It was, were crazy times, but we, we, we built all, all these uh, global systems. Uh, I mean, it's incredible what we, what we built back then in the 2000 years. It is amazing. But before we started recording, we were talking about the fact that you actually took a break from amateur radio, actually for quite a while. How did you get back into amateur radio? One thing you you should also know, I was, after military service, I was a professional radio operator for the Red Cross in Cameroon and uh, and in Damascus. Because back then uh, they needed people who who were able to do Morse and uh, they they needed people who were able to maintain a, a, a station and build antennas because nobody was there. I mean, we were in the bush. So you were able to use your amateur radio skills to help the Red Cross. And there, of course, we had to to more, especially in in Damascus, where where it was uh, 1982, Shabran, Shatila, these kind of things uh, were not nice. And uh, we had a lot of refugees and we had to find these people all over the place. So we had to transmit a lot of of data and names of, of refugees. And we worked eight hours a day on the keyboard were you using a keyboard or were you using like paddles i mean i had a paddle but i had a a typewriter because i had to give my information to 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 uh to other people with a typewriter it was much easier it's if you have a a 30 words per minute it's easier to, to to do this and more uh readable for others if i do it with typewriter Were they machine copying on the other end or were they relying on people typing as they're listening on the other end? It was a a completely manual process. Uh, I mean, um, Morse was manual back then. And then uh, the first thing I did with electronics and Morse, I built the world's best Morse trainer back then. And I was even able to sell it to the Swiss Army as a student because it was uh, mind-boggling back then. It was gamification. It was just a keyboard and uh, with an 8085 processor. And this keyboard uh, generated Morse code. And you had to type in uh, on the keyboard what you heard. Of course, you, you were able to be behind like a, a, a fast, a, a fast uh, a radio operator is usually behind this, uh, the transmitter. 
and then uh, the, the, this was synchronized in the, in the software. And then if you, if you typed a wrong, a wrong character, the system knew you had to train a little bit more with this character. Of course, if the best co- or the, co- the, the only compliment this, uh, this machine uh, were, was able to give you was to increase speed because it increased speed when you did not make any mistakes. So it, it adapted to your current speed and it adapted to your need of, for, for, special, for special training for special characters. And because of that, people, even old people or elder people, um, they wanted to, to get this bloody machine faster. And this was the ca- gamification uh, part of this. So they were training just to, to, to prove them that they were able to, to increase the speed on the, on the machine, basically. So the training was no more boring as, as, your, as your records, for example. It was, it was really interactive. So was that a business for you? Did you create lots and lots of units? I was one deal, 60 units, but I was rich afterwards for a student. (laughs) You didn't stay with it? No, no. And of course, I I had an MBA, so I knew how to do prices. The military uh, paid much more. I, I, I created a new version, more or less a different name and uh, increased the price by more than double when I sold it to them because I knew they have enough money. So this was also a good idea to have an MBA. So it was the first time I made some money with my MBA. Oh, that's amazing. Anyway, this uh, was a story, a story out of my life. But how did you get back into amateur radio then? By chance. Just by chance? Uh, I started... Coming back to electronics, I was also out of electronics during my family life because I didn't have a lot of time. And then a niece asked me, what does an engineer do? I, I want to know it because I have to, to decide where I want to go. And then I said, okay, you, you, you can come to me for a, for a Sunday and I, I show you. And then I thought, what will I show her? And uh, I bought my first Arduino. This was seven, eight years ago, maybe. And then uh, uh, with this first Arduino, I started to come back to electronics. Uh, where I sit here, this was basically my office. I have a, uh, my own company. We should describe, because this is an audio podcast. I'm looking at you on Zoom right now, and what I'm seeing is not an office office. You obviously are sitting at a desk, but what we're seeing now is a lot of workbenches, a lot of parts, a lot of test cables, things like this. So there's been a transformation since your niece asked you. Exactly. This started with the first Arduino seven, eight years ago. And uh, and then I, I, I started with the Arduino and stuff like that. And then people started to think, uh, to talk about uh, social media and stuff like that. And uh, my customers too. But I, I'm, I'm not the guy who, who talks about things he doesn't understand. So I said, okay, I want to learn about social media and I want to, uh, to get my hands dirty. And uh, then I asked myself back then, it was Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And I already, already learned a lot about the Arduino with YouTube. I, didn't, I still don't like Twitter and Facebook. So it was obvious for me that if I want to, to, to de- get my hands dirty, I go on YouTube. And then I said, I have a budget of $1,000, and this budget has to create a channel with 1,000 subscribers. I thought then I know a little bit at least uh, about about the social media. I have to ask the question so that I can set this up for the listeners. So I'm going to stop you for just a second. I'm a great fan of your YouTube channel. I'll put a link to it in the show notes pages. But you have over 330,000 subscribers now on your channel, and you've had over 30 million downloads of your videos. You're a natural teacher. I watch your videos. I'm now a patron of your channel. Thank you. You're a natural teacher. You describe yourself as the guy with a Swiss accent, but there's no accent that comes through when you're actually demonstrating the things mostly about Controllers, Raspberry Pis, Arduinos, um, some amateur radio projects. 
how did you start this channel with your thousand dollars? I mean, how did you get to three hundred and thirty thousand subscribers? It's the hen and the egg. Nobody waits if you start uh, uh, with the channel. So this was the the thousand dollars. You can do advertisement on on the YouTube, also as a as a single person. Then I had to think about the strategy, and this was my learning about social media, about how it works. I had to think about how can I create a channel, and uh, this is what my customers asked themselves too when uh, back then. And uh, then I, I I I watched which channels, which audience I would like, and what channels do they watch, and then uh, I placed an advertisement for my channel close to their to their channel and i you pay per click on, on youtube and i paid all, every every uh, new video got 1000 clicks paid from from me and until uh, basically it got 1000 clicks this was my budget it was about 30 dollars per per video and then uh, i said at least i'm on the map of 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 google or YouTube, with 1,000 clicks. And uh, then uh, I started in June, 22nd. 20, it's just as se- the, the sixth anniversary was last week or the f- week before. And, uh, and then uh, in November, the videos got already 1,000 clicks without paying. So I stopped and I had $800 spent 200 still still there and at christmas around christmas i had my 1000 subscribers and i could have stopped but you didn't i didn't no and uh, because uh, the interesting thing is i i publish every or back then uh, every every sunday a new video on on nine o'clock at nine o'clock in the morning my time and at 12 o'clock I got more compliments than in my whole uh, professional career before. So people really uh, uh, reacted as as you did. I like your content and stuff like that. And this, uh, then I was addicted. Let me take a quick break to tell you about my favorite amateur radio audio podcast. And that's the Ham Radio Workbench podcast with George KJ6VU. Jeremy, KF7IJZ, and it now includes Michael Walker, VA3MW, where they pursue topics, technology, and projects on their ham radio workbenches every two weeks. The group documents their projects and makes circuit boards available to their listeners. They have interesting guests and go in deep. Jeremy may complain about the overall length of the podcast, but friends, let me tell you that I could listen to it all day, and that's good. Even if you are a seasoned ham radio builder or just getting started, be sure to join George, Jeremy, and Mike now for the Ham Radio Workbench podcast on every podcast player. Use the link on this week's show notes page by clicking on the image. A new way to show your support of the QSO Today podcast is to buy me a coffee. I consume gallons of coffee to create this weekly podcast. Invite me for coffee by pushing the yellow button, buy me a coffee, on the QSO Today show notes page. And now back to our QSO Today. You say that you specialize in sensors and microcontrollers. I love the projects because they're all the kinds of projects that I would like to do. Like I'd like to build a Raspberry Pi controller that manages my Dropbox backups, for example, in my home network. Those are the kinds of levels that you work on, but you also work on a whole bunch of different levels, but they're all very practical. They're not too long. You're not spending a day on it. It's really quite amazing. What are the opportunities to apply sensors and microcontroller technology to amateur radio projects? Have you spent a lot of time thinking about that? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, there is a big gap today. Everything goes wireless, everything. I mean. Your mobile phones, your Bluetooth, everything goes wireless. Nobody likes wires these days. But the the universities do not train RF. It's hard to get RF training these days. So it's a huge gap. Everybody uses wireless. Nobody knows how it works. And this is 
uh, my channel, if you look, uh, you mentioned our sensors, microcontrollers, but if you, if you go through my videos, it always has a lot of wireless. Now, all ISM wireless, no ham, no ham, particular ham uh, radio. But um, I decided not to have a ham radio channel. I want to have an, uh, uh, wireless sensors. The, the, this is the combination on my, on my channel. But uh, the physical loss in, in an ISM band is exactly the same as it is in a, on a ham band. On a ham band. On 433 here in Europe, it's even the same, same frequency. So this is uh, basically what, what, where I am. And I hope also that I can get some of these makers interested in the ham radio op uh, operating and the ham radio hobby. And I, I quite often get a, a message. Now I have my license. For example, yesterday I had a, I had a, a message from a, one, a, a fellow YouTuber in, in, in Romania. I know quite well. And he, he, he sent me, a photograph of his new, newly uh, acquired license, and he was very proud. So, I'm a little bit the guy who, 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 um, who brings, bring, uh, hopes to bring other people into our, into our hobby, by showing them that wireless can be interesting, that antenna building can be interesting. I had weather balloons, for example. I had satellites, all wireless stuff, and uh, somehow also cool stuff. Also for, for young people, I mean, the average of my channel is, is, is in, the, in, thir in the 40s, maybe. I have elder people, I have younger people, but the, the, the maximum is, is around, around 40. So I have a, a relatively much younger people than the average ham channel. I found your channel because I was looking to build an earth station for the geostationary S-Hale Q0100 satellite with its onboard amateur radio transponder. Can you give us a short background on what that is and what you did with it on your channel? Yeah. When I was 16, we were in a, in a particular um, space in, in, in Switzerland for holidays, and there they had huge dishes for then geostationary satellites. This was, for me, very, very interesting back then. And... Uh, when I heard two years ago or so on, 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 on the radio that it is possible to create, to create a ground station like that in my, on, my, on my roof, there was no discussion. I wanted it. I, I, I wanted it. And uh, then, of course, I started to, to, uh, to think about it. I mean, software-defined radio was already on my plate. I, I, or I did also a good introduction. If somebody is interested in software-defined radio, uh, I have one, uh, an introdu quite a good introduction on my channel. So um, now I decided to build this ground station. And you have basically two ways to build a ground station for this geostationary satellite. Uh, it is to buy up and down converters ready-made and put them together and it, it, it works. But I didn't want that. I wanted to do it on my own. Also with prefabricated uh, parts, of course, because it's 10, gigaby uh, 10 gigahertz and uh, 4. the uplink is 2.4 gigahertz and the downlink is 10 gigahertz. But I wanted to do it with software defined radio and, and, and just to make my station uh, homemade. And uh, then uh, I, I discovered that uh, a lot of problems have to be solved. I mean, you have to build a 10 gigahertz hertz antenna. You have to, to build a, a 2.4 gigahertz antenna with dishes and, and uh, you, these kind of things. You have to, to find an amplifier for 2.4 gigahertz. And the worst is the frequency st stability. Nobody thinks about that on HF. But if you have to have a stable... Frequency and the stable frequency for SSB is on the hertz, more or less. I mean, and 10 gigahertz, you, you do not have enough uh, nines, 99.99999% uh, percent accurate. You have to be extremely accurate uh, on, on uh, 10 gigahertz. And uh, this uh, 
can only be done more or less if you want really want to do it with, is with a with a, um, a frequency standard. So these were all side projects, and then I decided to to do a a series. I think it is six six videos uh, about how to build uh, this uh, this Q one hundred station. And the interesting thing is back then. Uh, a Swiss guy was in, in the Antarctica on, the, on, a, on a research station. And the, this is a German research station. And uh, the Q100 is, uh, is, is, uh, is sponsored by Qatar a Telecom. But uh, this, the, the, most of the work was done uh, in, in Germany by, by AMSA Germany. And uh, that is why this German uh, research station in Antarctica has a Q0100 Q0 station and the Swiss guy back then. And then the, the headline was here, two Swiss guys, con uh, one in Switzerland, one in Antarctica, talking uh, across a geostationary satellite. That was then the headline. And I showed how, how, I, I was, uh, how, how this can be done. And uh, of course, we learned then about uh, about. Uh, GPSDOs and stuff like that, uh, how to get stable frequencies, which is also interesting for other, for, uh, for other people. It's my understanding, as I'm learning more about it, that it's a whole band. I mean, it's like a whole band, meaning that there's a CW at the bottom, there's digital modes, there's single sideband, there's even digital TV. It's 500 kilohertz, which is uh, usable for us. And uh, you have rules, but uh, basically you can do what... What do you want? Now, you're a builder. We had this conversation before we started that, you know, they're builder hams and they're operating hams. You're mostly a builder ham, but are you doing any operation on the QO100? Yeah, we have, for example, we have on Sunday evening, we have a, a Swiss round where we talk Swiss German. So it's, uh, it's encrypted for all the other. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is every week, uh, nine o'clock our time uh, in the evening. Uh, and sometimes I'm there, but not, not, not very frequently because I had to build my radio room two floors up because here I'm in the basement and the re reception here is nil. I built the radio, sh uh, the, my shack two, two floors up and I'm quite often here in, in the basement. So I, I do not listen to, to the bands usually. That is also quite reason. But it seems to me that a guy like you could obviously build a networked remote control head end down in your basement, right? So you could run the whole thing from your desk. I could, but I have, if I'm here, I have to work. If I have time, I can also walk two stories up. I, the only thing here, I have a DMR radio. If somebody is interested, I, I listen to the Reddit talk group. Uh, this is an international uh, talk group. Not always, but uh, quite frequently, I'm there. If you're a patron of your YouTube channel, then you also have a Discord channel as well, where I guess people could ask you questions or they could leave messages on your YouTube channel. One of the things I saw on your YouTube channel that you're doing a lot with right now is Lowra One. Now, in America, Lowra One is probably known but not well known. What is Lowra One and what are some potential applications for hams? We have to distinguish between Lora and Lora One. LoRa is a new uh, modulation on on different frequencies. You can use it. You can use it on 433, on 868, or in in, in the states on 915, but also on 2.4 gigahertz. They 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 create um, modules for these frequencies. All ISM band, uh, because uh, this is the market. The big market is ISM, license free ISM band. LoRa has chirps. It is not FSK or GFSK as the usual uh, modulation on these on these uh, weather stations and uh, weather balloons and all our FSK or GFSK frequency modulation. LoRa is has chirps. It has quite a big bandwidth of typically 125 kilohertz, which is more than FM. But LoRa means low power, long range, and it is has a, a, a a very special area where it is good, low power and uh, long range. And the third thing is, of course, capacity. And there, LoRa is very bad. It is slower than Morse, very slow. 
So it is particularly good for sensors and stuff like that. But um, when I it became 60, I saw that I can do a world record and uh, make me a, a, a birthday gift. And uh, then I, I decided to make a world record with LoRa. The LoRa uh, power is 500 milliwatts maximum. And the antenna was uh, Lambda a quarter of lambda on 868, which is seven centimeters or something. And with this antenna, I was able to reach, to get 203 kilometers range, which is, which is quite a lot. Of course, you have to have a line of, of sight. This was the, most, the, the biggest problem to solve, to find a place where you have a line of sight of, th- of 200 kilometers. But then it worked. So you see... And this, the, the chip costs a few dollars. It's a, 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 a whole station costs $25 shipped, but it works 200 kilometers on line of sight. And with Lo- we have now LoRa satellites, and there I, I frequently get, just with a ground plane, I get a reach of, or a range of nearly 2,000 kilometers. These LoRa satellites, are these the CubeSats that are maybe part of a college experiment, or are these part of some regular service that's up there now? For the moment, it's, it's mainly it's, it's, uh, students, or uh, for example, Stanford has now two up there. The Russians have, have uh, Israel has, I think, one. Uh, the Indians have one up there. And uh, the, recently, this was a, was a, um, a hype Basically, universities want to get wanted to get a satellite in in the orbit, and uh, they are usually on four thirty seven or something uh, handband uh, the satellite portion of it. So it's not allowed to set, uh, to transmit, but some of them are built also to relay. So if you have a, a license, you also can use them as a relay. But um, um, there is one commercial or one commercial. Uh, satellite i know of it's called lacuna and they do um they do transmissions and i have a sensor in my garden and uh, they have now three or four or five satellites so every day they they get my data i see so these are like store and forward so that as they pass over you uplink the data when it passes over somebody else perhaps that you're trying to send the message to exactly they have a grind station somewhere in england and then then it is downloaded and they, they use it, for, for example, for animal tracking in, in Africa and stuff like that. So in remote areas, it's not like, uh, like Starlink. It has very low capacity, but of course, it's much cheaper also. And it doesn't need a lot of power on the ground station. Right. So if you're a soda operator in the Swiss Alps, you could create an emergency radio using LoRa. I was even mentioned in a in a security report or one of my uh, of my videos was mentioned in a security uh, report where they talked about antifa and stuff like that and uh, i was named there because i had a project uh, called uh, mestastic mestastic which runs on 868 or 915 and it's a, a lora mesh communicator and my headline was underground communicator. And this is why I was uh, uh, featured in some Reddit channels. You don't want to be featured there, but uh, they like the idea to be independent from, uh, from any network providers. So I just l- liked the idea to have a, lo- uh, a LoRa ne- mesh network, which can transmit te- uh, text messages. And it's used for parachute uh, people and, and climbers and stuff like that in the States, because where you do not have a cellular uh, phone there, this, this, this network is, is quite good. You can also uh, put a relay somewhere on a hill, and because it's a mesh, it will adapt to this relay and it will automatically relay the things. And this was then... Uh, considered to be one of the weapons of Antifa, that they have a, a communication channel which is not, not discoverable. Of course, it is discoverable. It's, just, it's a normal... It's a normal um... My guess is that Antifa is probably buying little Chinese radios on the FM band or something like that. Maybe, but... 
it's just it's an interesting story. Uh, uh, viewers sent me that this this uh, this report where my as a danger for America basically was I was named as a nature as a danger for America. Well, I saw that video that you produced. I think that anybody that looks at that will know that the advantage of what you described and how to put that together is a great idea, like for families going someplace out in the wilderness where they can still have some kind of uh, text communications between their devices they already carry that are out of range of typical cellular LTE, 3G networks. So it's brilliant. I thought the video was brilliant. It was brilliantly done. I guess, you know, these days maybe it's a feather in your cap to be on somebody's watch list. <laughs> exactly. That's how I see it, because it was, it was exactly the purpose to have for groups and so on, the communication where you have no cell phone. That is the project. Right. And it was beautifully executed. And as I say, you're a natural teacher. They say the way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time. And I like how in your videos that you actually eat that elephant one bite at a time and you do it in such a way that it's quite digestible for people at a whole bunch of different technical levels. Thank you. You describe on your YouTube channel that while you operate some digital modes on HF, that you're getting back into CW. Yep. Don't you think that CW is kind of backwards and old-fashioned? And why do CW now as a guy at your technical level? Of course, it's uh, it's old-fashioned. That's why I like it. I mean, as, as I mentioned, I was a radio operator, and now I'm, a, I'm an old guy, and uh, also... Basically, I reactivated my hobby, my electronics hobby, which was also in which I executed in the in youth. So Morse is the same story. I just like the sound, and it's it's like uh, riding a bicycle. If you if you are able to do it once, uh, it was it was not too difficult to get to get back. Now I have to to train a little bit um, uh, the speed, of course, but uh, but. I, I am at uh, 20 words per minute or something like that. And, of course, also the, opera- the operating on, on the bands is also, you, I have to learn a little bit how, how a QSO is, is done. I forgot uh, a lot of this. So, but uh, just the Morse was, was quite, uh, quite simple. And, I, of course, I ported my old ideas about Morse trainers, my first two videos were about this Morse trainer, by the way. On an Arduino or Raspberry Pi? On an Arduino, yes. And now it's on an ESP32. Of course, it sends now with the statistics via wireless uh, to my Raspberry Pi, and, and, and uh, this is new. But, but the basic idea I described before is still the same. Well, you know, speaking of the bike, you just announced a few days ago that you're going on vacation for the summer, which means that those of us that like your channel are going to have to just suck it up for the month or two that you're gone. But you're quite a person on a bicycle. You had a goal in terms of riding your bicycle. What was that goal? Yeah, this year I have 5,000 kilometers. I don't know how much it is in miles, a little bit less. This is why we love kilometers. It sounds Sounds better. <laughs> uh, but, but anyway, uh, I, I, I uh, use my bike quite often. Two years ago, I uh, made a, a, a trip, 3,000 kilometers along the Danube River to the Black Sea with a colleague of mine. In 27 days, we, we, we pedaled from, uh, from Germany to, uh, to Romania to the Black Sea. Uh, to the Black sea. And uh, these, are, these are my small adventures. I, I, I still want to do from time to time uh, you might have also see, seen that i plan to go to to go to the pamir highway this year but this is not with a bicycle this would be too dangerous for me we go by car there but um do you have ham radio on board no are you taking any kind of radios even lower one on your trip no because there are enough risks for the moment with corona and all this stuff and i'm in a group I do not want to disturb the experience. Because... So you're in a group, and so, and I'm assuming that group has a chase vehicle or something like that for flat tires and injuries? I don't know, but, uh, but basically if I take my, my ham radio and I create problems, I create, do not create it only for me. I create also problems for my, for my fellow, fellows in the group. That's why I decided not to try. It's 
Tajikistan. Right. So uh, these people are probably not as uh, as, as fam- familiar on the countryside. This is why we, we go there. But they are probably not uh, very familiar. And the Pamir Highway is at the border of uh, to, to Afghanistan, which is also not an absolutely stable country. So I probably do not want to be uh, catched with uh, with a radio in in my in my luggage because uh, they might uh, think I'm somebody else. And my guess is that they probably would think you're somebody else. And you're already on the list, right? Yeah, <laughs> on the American list. So. <laughs> but you're on somebody's list. Yeah, but uh, the enemy of your enemy is your friend. That's right. We know that here. <laughs> So let me ask you, do you think that you could talk about what most excites you about amateur radio now? I mean, that it is possible, that it is possible to reach New Zealand with, with my, my wire antenna in my backyard. I have a, a, a high-end uh, end-fed antenna, nothing else. And uh, on FT8, I, I, uh, I got, I got to, to New Zealand. It's, and even uh, the sol- solar is not on the maximum. So it's it's uh, that is fascinating for me that it works. It's not uh, not as much as uh, as a, uh, having a QSO. I mean, you're in Israel. I'm in 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 Switzerland, and we can talk if we want. Uh, much easier than uh, on ham radio. So the talking is 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 also something uh, for for the use today to explain somebody a QSO, a young guy. He does not understand why the hell. Uh, do you create such a lot of problems? I can call him on Skype. I can whatever. I mean, a QSO is is a concept which was invented when when smartphones were not here. When it costed five dollars, and five dollars was a lot of money in the seventies for one minute to talk to to uh, to uh, to the US or to Australia. There. USO was something valuable for us. We were able to talk to these people. We were not able or not willing to pay this uh, this amount of money. Today, it's a QSO. And this is also why we have to pay attention. These days, the interesting thing on wireless is machine to machine, which is unattended, which is forbidden in most countries. And this is, in my opinion, the most critical thing for for ham radio if we want to get younger people interested in we have to go to unattended maybe only a watt or something because these these things do not uh, require uh, 1500 watts or whatever but uh, like whisper like fd8 like all these kind of things are somehow machine to machine and i think this is the future for for the builder hams at least not the not i mean the, the others is okay if you want to contest and stuff like that that is that is a sporty uh, sporty dimension but if i i talk about the builder hams they are very much interested in uh, like satellites and all these kind of i think the indians uh, uh, or i know the chinese uh, they put up now a, a satellite on 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 uh, hf 30 megahertz or something so there are a lot of things, uh, but it's all machine to machine. It's not a, Q- a, a typical QSO. Right, because these are not geosynchronous satellites. So we have to wait till they come. It makes sense to do the automatic communication when you're not there to wait for it to come overhead. Also for, for, for sensors uh, uh, in, in uh, like Windlink and all these kind of things, these digital modes are not, uh, not QSOs, but they are machine to machine. And of course, I mean, these LoRa stuff and so on, they are unattended. We have to be honest. Also, APRS is unattended in a way. But it's, it's still officially, it is forbidden. And I think the, uh, the amateur radio community should tackle this problem with, with authorities to find a way around it. Do you find, Andreas, that the more you know, the more that you're still amazed at how things work? like radio. I find that even the more I know, I still pinch myself that I'm a part of it and that it just works. It does not just work. It works, but you have to make it work. (laughs) You have to make it work. But what I'm saying is there's a sense of awe that I still have about radio that I got as a child. 
And even though I know quite a lot more about it now than I did then, it still leaves me awestruck. But also, if you look at an iPhone and all these kind of things, that these small structures, like atoms, and they work reliably, this is incredible for me. I mean, also that we can buy this for nothing. Well, on the one hand, on the other hand, you know, these iPhones require a trillion dollars worth of infrastructure to talk worldwide, whereas you can throw that long wire out your window and send an FT8 message around the world. Yeah, but what I wanted to say, when I was young, everything was expensive. Yes. A spectrum analyzer was way away from, from my, from my uh, capabilities back then. Now I can buy one for $50 and it works. It's not probably not as accurate as, or a VNA. A VNA, a VNA is, is as important as a multimeter for a ham radio operator. It is the multimeter for antennas was impossible, 5000 10000 and more dollars. These days, we do not pay $100, and it works. And it's close enough for government work. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't have to be right on, but it's close enough it actually shows you what's happening. And it's much better than you think. It's really much better. It's much better than you think. It's very accurate. The results, we compared it. This was one of my first... I was one of the first who discovered that these VNAs are not scrap, uh, not crap, uh, because I compared it with a Keysight VNA, and it, its results were absolutely, it was, they were not acceptable. They were good. And this is, uh, this is also, if you ask me, amazing. There is, everything is amazing in my life these days. Everything of what, what technology, what, and I can order something in China, and uh, uh, 30 days later, I get it in my mailbox for nothing. I mean, all, all the stuff in my lab here, it comes from China. And for my channel, it's very important that if I say I use this particular part, a guy in Pakistan, a guy in, in, in Brazil, a guy in the United States, a guy in Europe, everybody can order exactly the same product. My channel would not be possible if we would not have this global supply. If I would have, if I would have to source in Switzerland... This would be of, of no value for all other for, for all I for all other my, my maker colleagues, my, my viewers. They have to get this stuff, the same stuff to build to rebuild my, my, my projects. A Raspberry Pi, you mentioned it. All these kinds of global global products now which can be sourced on a on a global basis. This is for me the basis of my channel. Well, one of the things I like what you do is you'll also go to component level and you'll pull the data sheet and you'll actually kind of go through the block diagram of the product, whether it's a chip that's prolific in a lot of different devices. So I think that you go in nice and deep, which I happen to like, but not so deep that you can't eat the elephant. So I really appreciate that. The most, the, 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 the most important word in, in, on my YouTube channel and probably also on others is no. I have to leave out 95%, but I have to hit the right 5%. And this is basically what you, what you talked about, uh, teaching capabilities. That is what I would see as, as teaching capabilities, that you find out what is important and leave all the rest away. Because if you know too much about the topic, you, you get into rat holes and then people do not understand you. But if you, I try always to, to, leave, to leave out most of, of, of the stuff. That is the most. And I have to say, I do all script. I, it's all scripted because I cannot uh, get this density with, with uh, natural speech. And uh, my, um, my scripts, this is not once I do it. I do it several times. And... Uh, I don't know if Goethe is, uh, is well known in the world, but he, he's a, he was a writer back then and he wrote a, a letter to his colleague, uh, sorry, I didn't have enough time. Uh, that is why my letter became a little bit longer. This is exactly what I feel when I do my scripts. It takes a lot of time to get a short script. Well, they say for every hour of production, you might have 20 hours of pre-production time or post-production time? 
if I know the, the, the project, if the project is the programming, the research, everything is done, just production, 10 hours for 15 minutes. Right. It certainly shows in terms of production value. Do you have any advice that you'd give to new or returning hams to the hobby? Uh, we, we had it already a little bit. I think we should find a way that we old guys know about RF. The young guys are interested in wireless, but have no clue about RF, no clue about antennas. And I think if we would be able to, to bridge this gap it would be something for us, for, all, for our old guys, because we would work with younger people and, uh, and, and uh, would stay young in a way. I, 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 I think I stay young with my projects, or at least uh, I have to, to, to learn a lot of things. So this would be my dream if the, if the guys who know the RF, and I mean, if, if, you, if you watch on YouTube, there are a few elder people, maybe even older than I am, which show RF stuff. Most of the, of the RF stuff is demonstrated by, I would say, old people, retired people, because they know it. The young people, hardly young people do RF stuff. And this is where we could do something. We could find ways for, to, to, towards the, the maker community and our bond would be wireless. We call it radio we call it rf they call it wireless but it's exactly the same thing it has antennas it has propagation it has uh, <laughs> rf i mean uh, one gigahertz today is dc in my youth or it's like dc in my youth i buy a, a module for 2.4 gigahertz for five dollars and it works uh, it, it, it's it's ridiculous 30 megahertz is, is, is nothing, is absolutely nothing these days. And when I was young, 30 megahertz was today every transistor, every FET transistor can do 30 megahertz. You can use the cheapest transistor for, for 30 megahertz power amplifier. Uh, I mean, this is ridiculous these days. You can buy 122 gigahertz transceivers that go on the back of people's cars for parts costs, right? I mean, the, the radars are also, front radars are, are on 70 me, uh, gigahertz or something. It's, it's incredible. It's quite amazing. So basically, this would be my wish if, if we would be able to, uh, to do more collaboration. For example, in Germany, they have now collaborations with, with, a, with a Pi community, and they invent them to their uh, conventions or, or, um, or exhibitions and stuff like that. So you see young people, you see old people. I mean, the hams are, we have to be honest, they are, they are uh, the average age is, I don't know, but in the 60s probably. And, and the, the Pi people are much younger. So, but the wireless would be something, the glue in between, in, in between. Not everybody is interested from the young guys, but I think they're much more interested if they would understand that there is something called wireless. I mean, now it's just a, for them, it's just a tool. But then they, they have questions, why the hell does this LoRa does not work, for example? And then they come to antennas. And then they come to my videos. And then hopefully they come to amateur radio. I mean, given your reach, it seems to me that 1% of your subscribers is still 3,000 people. Yeah. That wouldn't be a bad ham radio turnout. Andreas, I want to thank you so much for joining me on the QSO Today podcast. This is really a great thrill for me, and I want to wish you 73 and hope to work you on the air or on LoRa or on Q100. On Q100, of course. Uh, I'm looking forward. Just tell me and we, we, we can do a QSO. Unfortunately, the Americans cannot do it. They have to ask uh, Ellen or somebody who brings up a satellite. should be possible in the States. At some point, they'll work it out. 73. 73, Eric, and thank you very much for the, your interview. That concludes this episode of QSO Today. I hope that you enjoyed this QSO with Andreas. Please be sure to check out the show notes that include links and information about the topics that we discussed. Go to www.qsotoday.com and put in HB9BLA in the search box at the top of the page. Be sure to click on the Expo menu item at the top of the page for updates on the upcoming QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo coming in August. 
I'm updating it with more information as it comes in. I love the efforts of YouTubers like Andreas and support his and many podcasts with my financial gifts and Patreon subscriptions. If I don't say it enough, then you should know that I am extremely grateful for your support, sponsorships, coffee, and using my Amazon link. As I approach retirement age, you make it possible for me to pursue all of my QSO Today projects with more of my time. Thank you so much for that. My thanks to ICOM America for its support of the QSO Today podcast. Please show your support of ICOM America by clicking on their banner in the show notes pages. You may notice that some of the episodes are transcribed into written text. If you'd like to sponsor this or any other episode into written text, please contact me. Support the QSO Today podcast by first joining the QSO Today email list by pressing the subscribe buttons on the show notes pages. I will not spam you or share your email address with anyone. Become a listener sponsor monthly or annually by clicking on the sponsor buttons on the show notes pages or use my Amazon link before shopping at Amazon. Amazon gives me a small commission on your purchases while at the same time protecting your privacy. I'm grateful for any way that you show appreciation and support. It makes a big difference as I head towards episode 400. QSO Today is now available in the iHeart, Radio, Spotify, YouTube, and a bunch of other online audio services including the iTunes Store. Look on the right side of the show notes pages for a listing of these services. You can use the Amazon Echo and say, Alicia, play the QSO Today podcast from TuneIn. My thanks to Ben Bresky, who edits every single show and allows both this host and my guest to sound brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Until next time, this is Eric, 4 z one ug 73. The QSO Today podcast is a product of KEG Media Inc., who is solely responsible for its content.